You're listening to the I Have Dreams Damn It podcast, a podcast about the realities of pursuing dreams. I'm your host, Lisa Murray, and let's get started. Live from Los Angeles, California, this is the Lisa Murray Show, and with your host, Lisa Murray. The day I felt like I really started living. I don't have enough money to start this business. I'm so tired. I hate it. I'm working all the time. I'm not inspired when I'm worried about money. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. I'm so sick of all these positive people talking about dreams, dreams, dreams. What about money? Like, how am I supposed to get the money? What it's really about, it's about you pursuing what makes you come alive. It's about continually connecting with that energy and just keep doing that. Keep going towards that. That's what it's about. You need to give up. There's, just, there's too many obstacles. I can't take this shit Ships anymore. are safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. It feels really good to be my own boss. I have dreams, damn it! So as I've promised, probably since the very first show, I was going to talk to you guys about the hero's journey because that is what is part of my show art all over the bulletin board with the different stages. I refer to this many times and some people know about it and some people don't. So this show is all going to be about the hero's journey, what it is, how it came into my life, how I became aware of it, and then how I utilize it today for my own self-awareness and growth, both as an artist and as a person. So first I'm going to go over the different stages just quickly, and then I'll go back and I'll talk about it a little bit more. So depth psychology, which was founded by Carl Jung, and then the mythical structure of storytelling, which is Joseph Campbell's work, Those two things together is what caused Christopher Vogler to write The Writer's Journey. So I follow Carl Jung's work in depth psychology, and then I also follow Joseph Campbell's work with his Hero of a Thousand Faces. And as a screenwriter, I love Christopher Vogler's The Writer's Journey book. It's very, very good. And I base what I'm saying when I say hero's journey off of Chris Vogler's interpretation because it just resonates the most truthful to me. It's very close to Joseph Campbell's Hero of a Thousand Faces, so it's similar. So as Chris Vogler mentions in his book, all stories consist of a few common structural elements found universally in myths, fairy tales, dreams, and movies. They are known collectively as the hero's journey. So what are the hero's journey? So there's elements to it, but then there's also sort of stages to it. And in screenwriting, it's broken up into acts. Wait, first I should tell you how this even came into my life. Okay. So, so as I've mentioned before, I've always wanted, I've always been drawn to the entertainment industry and, you know, it originally was wanting to be an actress. That was my thing. And then I got more into like directing people like on stage in acting classes. And then that naturally led me to be like, well, I don't want to just, you know, direct other people's work. I want to direct my own work. I want to write stuff. And I always liked writing. I just didn't think I was very good at it when I was like in high school. So by the time I was about college aged, I decided I was going to be, I was going to make it a, you know, a thing. I was going to learn how to become a better writer. I really wanted to learn that. So I did. I had some very hardcore English teachers in college and they they kind of pushed me. And then that really showed me what my voice was. That mixed with my intention of wanting to become a better writer. I just felt like it was an avenue of expression for me and not having those tools to be able to express myself that way was limiting me. So I really put a lot of energy into writing. So I took different screenwriting classes at like New York Film Academy and places like that. And then I was actually living in Chicago, um, helping take care of my grandmother. And I saw that there was this writer's journey, basically mythical structure workshop, two day workshop thing happening at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, which is about an hour north of where my grandmother lived at the time. Never heard anything about it. So went up there. As I was sitting in this seat and they were going over what the class was about, I literally felt like I was kind of like leaving my body. Like, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you ever get like where you you had no idea what something was going to be like and then you get into that situation and you're like, it's even more than what you could have 
known to ask for. Like it was so for you, it was so exactly what you needed and wanted and thought about, but didn't know you thought about it. And like, it was just this unbelievable marriage of psychology and storytelling. And that's the whole thing with me. I kept going back and forth between, you know, my major in college was psychology, but then I always loved film. And so I would get really involved in psychology and everyone's like, oh, you're so good at helping people and helping people understand stuff and everything. And I was like, yeah, but I always want to do film. And so then I'd get really involved in film and it felt empty to me. It just felt like this isn't what I want. This is not it. And what I really like about, you know, I love psychology and I love helping people, but I love helping people that don't know that they're looking for help or that maybe they don't even want to look for help. I love the idea that in a dark movie theater, somebody is having their mind opened and their emotions activated that maybe hasn't been opened or activated in many years because we feel safe in the dark theater or in our living room nowadays. Most people watch movies at home, but you know, we feel safe when we're watching a movie and that's sort of like a Trojan horse, like sneaking that message and that story and that the help really into that story. I love that because I feel like that's, that's my calling. That's where I feel driven mostly is helping people when they don't realize they're even looking for it, that type of thing. So I've always loved film. So I'm in this classroom and this woman named Dara Marks, and she has I know she has one book out. She might have more books out. Um, I will put Dara's website um, and any information I find for her on the show notes on IHaveDreamsDammit.com. So you can visit the show notes and it's episode number eight. Okay. So I, she was one of the instructors and there was another person. I can't remember what the other person was. One person dealt with like just, you know, screenwriting structure, story structure, like from a very technical point of view. And then she dealt with it from this mythical point of view. And I was just like blown away. Like I felt like I could fly. I could fly up out of my seat into the ceiling and into the sky. Like I just felt like I could just, I was like, yes, yes, yes. This is the thing. And the thing I loved about it too, is that what you learn about the hero's journey is a human being's journey in life and why we're here and what we're here to do. We're here to learn. We're here to experience things. And it's an adventure. And there was just so many parallels to, I saw for my own life and for the people in my life's life, in my life's life, I don't know how to say that, (laughs) that I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this could change people's lives. This could really help people beyond story. This could be like a psychology tool. And then I found Chris Vogler's The Writer's Journey book, and that became my Bible. Like I literally walk around with it everywhere. I don't think I've lived anywhere where I don't have a version of it because I buy books too to send to people especially if they're like oh I want to be a storyteller or I'm interested in story that's the first thing I tell them is get Chris Vogler's writer's journey and if you don't have it if you're a writer definitely I think you should have it the writer's journey by Chris Vogler I'll have a link in the show notes Um, but also just in general if you're an artist it's extremely helpful to know the stages and to understand these different elements that kind of come at us and affect us. Because Joseph Campbell basically studied religions and mythologies all over the world and throughout time. And they all have these similarities and they all have these common thread stories of like a hero's journey. And that's why he says it's a hero of a thousand faces. They all have different manifestations of the story or whatever, but this idea of this central story is universal. It's the human experience. And I think that is amazing and incredible, and I love it. Do you love going to farm stands and buying fresh from the farm produce? Do you have to pull over on road trips to pet a cow? No? Okay, maybe that last part's just me. Regardless, regardless, we can all agree on our love for all things agriculture. And how about art? Don't you love watching films about artists, painters, singers, dancers, musicians? 
coming in September is the Ag and Art Film Festival in Vacaville, California. And they are open for entries. So if you have a film, a narrative, a documentary, a short or a feature, if you're a student or if you're a pro, this is your chance to show your film to the world. And by the world, I mean Vacaville, California. But still, it's going to be awesome. Visit agandartfilmfestival.com for more information, and you can submit your film exclusively on filmfreeway.com. Okay, so now I want to go through the different stages, just a, a quick overview, and then I'm going to go back through and explain it a little bit more. And if you want to look at the podcast art, um, the one that has the the different stages all the way around, it goes clockwise from the top. So let's start from the very beginning. So in the very beginning, we have the departure separation. That's in act one. So you have a normal world and then you have the main character or me or you departing from our normal life. And we go into this adventure. So that breaks down into the ordinary world call to adventure, which is what one of my shows was all about. So you should know about that. The refusal of the call, the meeting of the mentor, and crossing the first threshold. So there's act one. It's all put together. Act two is descent, initiation, and penetration. So this breaks down into tests, allies, and enemies. Approach to the innermost cave and ordeal. And reward. And then act three is the return. So you've had this experience. You've been broken down You've had all these challenges come at you and God knows what. Now in act three, in a story, it's when it turns and when the hero starts to kind of return back to their normal life. But now they've got this new information from the journey and they're a new person. So the return is broken down into, and this is Chris Vogler's writer's journey. That's what I'm basing this off of. Um, The return act three is the road back, resurrection, and return with the elixir. Okay, so basically a hero leaves her comfortable, ordinary world. There's just, you know, some of these things are kind of exaggerated so that they make a point. Sometimes it's literally how it is for you. Like maybe everything was fine until you got this cancer diagnosis or everything was fine until that car accident or, you know, 9-11 or whatever. There's some type of event or there's something that happens. And you can either go on that journey or not go on that journey. So when the call to adventure comes, you don't have to listen to it. You can cling to your normal life. And, you know, I mean, sometimes I think that we're forced into it, though. I think that it's like, no matter what we do, it's, it's, it's coming to find you, whatever this adventure is. But sometimes it's, it's elective. It's something that you don't necessarily have to do. And, Maybe you choose it because you want something better for your family or for yourself or for the society or culture. You feel like, no, I really want to do this because I want something better. And so you heed that call and you you start that adventure. So the call to adventure in Star Wars is when Princess Leia, the hologram shows up and she's asking Obi-Wan Kenobi for help. Um, Different people think, you know, different stuff, but let's just say that is the call to adventure because that's kind of like the most typical type of call to adventure. She's calling for help. Please help. Please help. He doesn't have to help. You know, Luke Skywalker can stay in his town until, you know, everything goes to hell in a handbasket. Or he can say, wait a minute, let me go and see what's going on with this. Maybe I can help. I just want you to think about the call to adventure as being elective or sometimes we're forced. So think about in your life, when has there been a call to adventure? When has something happened that set you on a direction or on a path? Just think about that while we're going through this. So the refusal of the call is when there's reluctance. Um, When there's smartly someone saying, no, I'm not going to do that. Why should I risk all my stuff? No, I'm not doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, But sometimes you know, it just, the, the hero or you needs extra motivation. Maybe whatever the original call was, wasn't, it wasn't hitting home yet. And then maybe when you find out that your nephew or your son or something, it, when you realize it's someone closer to you than just someone in the news or whatever, then maybe that, 
your motivation has kicked up and the call has gotten stronger and then now the refusal will shift. So the next one is kind of interesting is the mentor. It's like the wise old man or woman. It can literally be a wise old man or woman, or it can be a wise type character somehow, you know, like Rafiki in the Lion King, like something that comes in with wisdom that kind of sets you on your path. According to Chris Vogler's writer's journey, he says the function of mentors is to prepare the hero to face the unknown. So they may give advice, guidance, or magical equipment. The mentor might be with the hero for a while, but ultimately the hero needs to go on this journey alone. They need to go on that. This is their journey. And the mentor knows this. And they have just come to sort of give them something to help them along their journey. Next up is the crossing of the first threshold. So now that the hero has committed, now that you've committed, okay, I'm going to go back to school and get my degree. You've committed. Now you've crossed the first threshold. This is when like the ship sails, the romance starts, the plane takes off, like whatever it is starts. Vogler also explains that when based on the three acts, he says that it can be basically broken into the first act is the hero's decision to act. The second act is the action itself. And the third act is the consequences of the action. Yeah. So the crossing of the first threshold, um, ends first, the first act. That's sort of like, usually the acts shift at an energy point. So that's an energy point because now there's movement and there's a decision and there's that swiftness of action. Like, okay, let's go. I'm going to take this journey. I'm going to get on the Titanic. I'm going to get on this flight. I'm going to go on this love adventure with this person or whatever it is. I'm going to enroll in school. It's the moment when Dorothy gets out onto the yellow brick road. It's when you just, you know, that moment when you're shifting into that. So now in act two, you're hit with tests, allies, and enemies. I like how it just sounds all cute. Like tests, allies, and enemies. That's like the word. That's like the part where, you know, you can just get completely lost in that whole area. <laughs> well, the allies is good because that's where you get your friends. So that's like, you know, in, in the Wizard of Oz, that's when she starts getting her, her friends, right? That's when she gets the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion. I mean, that's how she gets all those friends. But then she also gets, you know, the awful grumpy talking trees and the horrible flying monkeys. I mean, everything that's all awful too, but it's, it's, you know, like in, uh, in Star Wars, it's the cantina scene. So he finds out who his friends are, but he also finds out there's some really bad, you know, bad people here. There's or whatever they are, bad creatures in this world. And so it's kind of like, I think of for, you know, I have a lot of office jobs in my past. And I think of like, whenever I started a new office job, that's to me, the test allies and enemies, because I find out who my friends are. You know, you, you kind of find that out when you start a new job, like, okay, so Kelly in accounting is actually really cool. And she's, you know, she helps me with stuff. And Bob in finance is a D because he is like so mean to me and he never answers my emails, you know, or whatever. So you start to kind of figure out who your people are and who are not your people. The next stage is the approach to the inmost cave. And this is like the first time that there's a real kind of, it's starting to get dangerous. It's not just fun anymore. It's not like, you know, songs and follow the yellow brick road. You know, it's not cute. It's like actually starting to get a little bit scary. So in Wizard of Oz, it's when Dorothy was being kidnapped by the Wicked Witch. So the in approach to the inmost cave is when they're, the main characters are facing either a death or a massive, like something very dangerous. That's when the first major thing that's starting to happen. And then the ordeal is where you really don't know if you're going to make it or not. It's not just, you know, like all fun and games anymore. It's not just like, oh, wow, this is exciting. You actually, as an audience member, are even kind of like, wait a minute, this person's not going to die, are they? Like, you know, that's when it really gets where it's pretty intense. And in Star Wars, it's when they were stuck inside of that big trash compactor thing that smashes them. I remember watching that going, oh my God, what's going to happen? Like, it's so scary because you can't even picture how they're going to get out of that. So in this, in this moment, um, Vogler explains that the reason why this, this part of the story is so important is that the main character has to appear to die so that she may be born again. Um, everything in life and in nature is always breaking down and rebuilding, breaking down and rebuilding. 
And even for us, we're needing to be, in order for the new lessons and the new us to happen, we need to have the old us broken down. And you can't have the old you broken down if you're clinging to, you know, status quo and everything's the same. The way that it gets broken down is by being out on that limb and really being out of your comfort zone and you're out on this adventure and maybe there's this huge obstacle that feels a thousand times bigger than you and it really does seem like, well, this was a bad idea. I don't know why I decided to do this because now look where I am. Look at this now. Look what's happening. And it does feel like a death. Like sometimes like maybe you decide to go back to school. So you're working full time, you're going to school at night and maybe, you know, one of your friends that you've been friends with for a long time says, I don't like this new you. I liked it better when, you know, we would have wine after work and we would talk and like, you never want to talk anymore. All you want to do is go to school. And it's like, I mean, this is just a small example, but it, it, for you, if that's your really close friend, it feels like a death. Cause you're like, you're like, wait, what? Why? Like, why would that happen? I'm doing something good for myself. I thought you're my friend, but not everybody, you know, like last week's episode where I talked about friendships, you know, not all friendships can make it with us on this journey. They, you know, they start to flip out on you sometimes and they just, they don't like you. They don't like you being the way you are. They just don't like it. They like you being predictable and being the way that you used to be. And so that's sort of like a little death. That's a, the hero facing a death of a friendship and of that part of themselves. Like, yeah, they're not that person that goes home from work and has wine with their next door neighbor anymore. Because now when they get off work, they go straight to school. And now the friend doesn't like it. And now the friend is decided that they don't even want to hang out and figure out what's going to happen next. So that's like a little death, right? And a little rebirth of, I guess I am really doing this. I guess I'm really doing this school thing and I'm losing people because of it. And I'm losing other things too. But you know, it's like, there's always been, there's always like these secret fears that are going on in the background that I don't think we even realize until something like that happens, like a friendship or something happens. And then we realized that was probably a fear that we had all along that people would not understand people that were close to us. And we didn't, it was just a vague feeling of like, well, I can't really go back to school. I can't really do that. And you don't really know why. And then one day you go, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm putting myself first. I'm going to do it. And then you're totally jamming out and you're feeling good. And then your friend flips out on you and you're like, wait, what's going on? And it does feel like, oh my God, this was a bad idea. Why did I do this? But if you really know yourself and you do some soul searching and you're like, wait a minute, I'm doing this to better myself. Yeah, I'm not going to be hanging around and being how I was before, but I'm doing this to better myself. I'm not doing this to hurt anybody. And it's temporary. School is only for so long. And then when I get out of school, I'll be able to get a better job and I'll be able to be a psychologist and counsel people. And like, why would that be a problem with my friend? Why don't they have patience for me? I've really been there for them. So really, if you think about it and you write it down or just talk about it with someone that you trust, you'll see that it's okay. Like you're not doing the wrong thing, that the friend is actually just bugging out because now their world has changed and they don't like it. So it's okay. And you know what? When you realize that you're really dedicated to yourself and to this new life, it's going to give you so much energy and you're going to have so much love for yourself. You're going to be like, Oh my God, I'm so awesome. I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm even doing this, even though I might be losing friends. And this is awesome. Not that you want to lose friends, but you're willing to face that huge thing that it's, you know, we're social be beings and it's in very hard for us to go against that feeling that people are going to not approve of us. People that we know very well that they're going to turn on us. That's a huge fear. And so if you face that fear and you come out the other side, dedicated, rededicated deeper to what you want to do, that's a really good feeling. And that's like, it gives energy to the rest of your story and to the rest of what you're going for. It happens also like in fraternities and sororities when they do the, you know, different things that they put their pledges through, you know, and then when they finally come out the other side, it's more of like an earned thing. Like I did this, I sacrificed something. It was hard. I'm not talking about the crazy hazing that goes all cray cray. I'm talking about cute little fun and game stuff. But, you know, it's just, it's that feeling of like, I'm really, you know, there's, there's something at stake here. This isn't just like you lean over and you get a college degree. I mean, you have to really sacrifice stuff. You have to go out of your comfort zone. You have to possibly lose friends. You have to lose some sleep, lose some leisure time and really put a lot into it. And that Getting that degree after all of that is going to be that much sweeter for you. 
So the next stage after that is reward. And then he has in parentheses, seizing the sword. So it's kind of like after the hero has the treasure, possession of the treasure, or you know whatever it is, that is, let's say you finally, you're, I'm using this person who's gone back to school as an example. So let's say they have their degree. They finally got it. And no matter all the different things that were happening all around them, their boss was mad at them and because they were uh, not able to work late when, you know, the rest of the staff was required to work late. They couldn't because they had to go, you know, you had to go to school and you lost friends because they didn't understand what was going on. Um, you went through all that. You weren't sure if you'd have the tuition money, you had to get some grants and then you had to get some student loans and just it, just all the stuff you went through to go back to school. And now you have your college degree. That is like the reward. You did it. All that stuff was for this moment. And you finally have your college degree. Thank God you did it. So in the, in the, um, Wizard of Oz is when Dorothy escapes from the wicked witch's castle with the witch's broomstick and the ruby slippers. And she's going to go back home. And she's like, yes. And even in the movie, you're like, finally, okay, everything's back on track now. This is when we love the main character of a movie the most. This is when we're like, yes, you know, we're, we're with them. Hopefully if the movie is, is written and acted and directed well, this is when we are the most excited for them. We're like, cause we're feeling what they're feeling. We're like, yeah, I did it. Whatever it is. Right. So the next stage is the road back. Just like in the, uh, romancing the stone, when he has the stone, he still has to leave the cave before the entire cave collapses. So this is like, you know, the person who went back to school, they pushed a lot of things away and didn't deal with a lot of stuff because they were so focused on getting their degree. So friends were dropping out, you know, bosses were getting pissed, like all these different things were happening, but they just stayed like laser focused to get that degree. So now they have that degree, but now they've got to deal with the consequences of that time of them going towards that degree the consequences of all those relationships, they have to go back and kind of sit with that and see what everything is. Cause now they're like out of school, they're done with that. And you have to kind of figure out what's the lay of the land. And some people might just be a little bit annoyed by your behavior. And some people might outright be pissed and have a lot of resentment towards you and not be happy that you got your, your uh, degree. And also like in movies, that's when the evil forces of the opposition, they're the worst. That's when they're the strongest and the craziest because now you've taken something from them and they are going to come after you and it's not going to be pretty. So it's a very, very dangerous time in this story and in the story of us. So this stage marks the return to the ordinary world. So you're saying like, okay, I want to go back to everything that's normal, but I know I'm not normal anymore, but I want to go back. So the next stage is resurrection. Vogler mentions in ancient times, hunters and warriors had to be purified before they returned to their communities because they had blood on their hands. The hero who has been to the realms of the dead must be reborn and cleansed in one last ordeal of death and resurrection before returning to the ordinary world of the living. So you're all wild and into it and you're like a warrior and you're like, yes, I can make stuff happen. I can go out there and create all these crazy things and manifest stuff. I'm a warrior, 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 but you got to go back and just regular daily life. Like the, you know, the copier is broken and you still have to pay your car insurance and you still have to like, you know, go to the dentist and have your teeth cleaned and like just basic life stuff. You still have to go back and do that. But you now are like kind of cray cray because you have been through this major ordeal and you have all these like in the, you know, in wizard of Oz, you've got the flying monkeys chasing you. You've got real stuff coming at you. And so this is like in the story when there's the ultimate kind of death, when you really do think, okay, this is now the end. Like the one before I can see now is wasn't really anything. This is the real death and rebirth part of the story because this is when the, the obstacles and the, the opposition is the most deadly and the most craziest. And so sometimes in my life, if I'm moving towards something, if I've made a decision to better my life or to start a business or whatever, I notice that it gets extra, extra, extra crazy at this point. It's like, I really, I'm triggered for me. It's, you know, that in the psychology part of this, it's imagined things. And sometimes they're real, but it's ultimately like, 
I really, I'm going to be homeless. Like, I don't know. I can't, well, how am I going to pay my rent? I'm going to have to be kicked out. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So it's like real stuff, but it's all that fear that comes up. And so maybe in this part of it, you actually come home and you're finally feeling like, okay, I sorted everything out with my friends. My boss is a jerk, but I've got him calmed down now. And then you go back to your apartment and there's an eviction notice on the door. And then when you go out to your car because you forgot you left your purse in the car with your phone and you go out there and your car has been stolen, everything gets taken up even more and it's even crazier. And it actually feels like, well, I actually really can't do this. Like I can't do this without a place to live in my car. Like, what am I going to do? And so that's the best story. They always say the best storytelling is a story that has a really good villain. And if the villain is really good and really strong, then the story is really good. Because if the villain's kind of weak, we don't really buy the whole thing. And we're just like, oh, yeah, right. Like, you really had a hard time doing that. But if the villain is really believable and scary to us and like, oh, my God, this guy's crazy or whatever, that really brings us into the story. And that's what it's all about. It's by, you know, engaging in our, our whole selves into the story of life. So when we have something that is challenging us in that whole body experience kind of way and all of our it's real stuff happening, like real stuff, like being fired or your, you know, spouse asks you for a divorce or, you know, real things like in my life, having some people die in my life. I thought, okay, that's it. That's it. All right. You know, it's all fun and games until someone dies. Like majorly important people in my life died. I no longer want to do this anymore. I don't care. And it took me many years to want to continue to want to keep going. And then just all of a sudden one day, little by little, I mean, I did a lot of stuff during that time, but I did allow myself to be like, Hey, if you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it. Like I didn't pressure myself. Um, but all of a sudden one day I just sort of felt like, yeah, okay. I am going to get back out there. I am going to do something in the world and give back in some way. And so if I'm going to do that, then I've got to come back from this. I've got to survive this. And so even though it felt insurmountable and at the time I had made a decision, I'm not coming back from that. I was like Jason in the Friday the 13th movies. It was just like, like open my eye. Like I didn't even think I would even have this anymore. I didn't think I'd have any desire at all, but it's weird. I just, you just do like, it's who you are. And you know, when you have a calling and there's something you, or something you just really love to do in life no matter how much stuff happens to you, it's, it's, it, I think in time, it'll always come back to you because it's so much of who you are. And even though it might be damaged for a while and bruised for a while and needs time to heal, the part of me that wants to give back through story, through this podcast, through my films is always pushing at me. It's always there. And it's like a companion. And I think that was another part that made the grieving process so desolate and lonely and painful for me is that I lost that part of myself. And that's such like my best friend my whole life. And to not have the part of me that wants to do this and wants to give back, I felt like I was, they, I was killed. I was dead. I felt like a walking dead person. So with this part back, it's really helped me feel better about life again and start that road back and start that resurrection. And, you know, little by little, and I've had to try to figure out like, how do I cleanse myself of this death that I've experienced, but not lose the lesson in it? How do I bring myself back to regular society where I'm just talking about, well, where'd you get your shoes? And, oh, I had pasta last night. I shouldn't have pasta last night. Like the amount of small talk that goes on in the world is just so hard for me to absorb sometimes. (laughs) But you know, you can't just walk up to people and be like, yeah, so like this really important person in my life died and it's suspicious and it might be murder, but what are you doing? (laughs) You know? And so I had to figure out, like, bring it back to regular life. Like, don't let it go. Don't repress it. Don't forget it. But how do I get back into the regular world and start talking to people and, you know, everything, just get back into the world and engage with the world and still have this other part of me that I'm connected to. That took a while. That was my resurrection. And I feel like this podcast, I mean, I even wanted to call it the Elixir podcast, but there's a podcast called the Elixir podcast. There's a bunch of Elixir ones. And I still may change it one day to some variation of Elixir 
because this podcast is my elixir. And I don't want to do this podcast if it isn't like an elixir of the story that I've been through and the things that I've learned from what I've been through and the things that have helped me get through these things. The last part of all this after the resurrection, which is the final stage, is return with the elixir. So now the hero has returned to the ordinary world, but now they have this treasure or lesson or something that they got in the special world. There's something they got. And for me, it's not just one thing. It's not like I can hold it in the palm of my hand and say, I learned this. This is what I learned. But it's a series of things about how, like, I faced the ultimate fear, which is death, Um, death of myself and the death of very important people to me. And it wiped me out, traumatized me. And I really didn't think I could come back from that. And I didn't want to come back from that. As I just said, I did not want to, that was the biggest part. I, it's so weird. It's not that I didn't think of, I wasn't sitting there going, Oh, I just don't think I can come back from this. It was like an anger. Like, I don't want to come back from this. I'm not going to help people. I'm pissed. I'm pissed at whatever is going on with this place called life. I'm pissed. Like, I don't want to help anybody. I just want out of here. Like, what is this place? And so that took a long time. So Now that I am in the place of like, okay, I really, I want to bring this elixir back. I want to help because now my thing is maybe I won't live that much longer. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll live to be, you know, a hundred years old. I don't know. But if I don't live for much longer, let me at least leave a piece of something of goodness with somebody else. Let me at least help like with this podcast. I really just want to help you continue on your journey. Um, I want to help. I'm so in touch with the idea that I can die, my mortality, that every week when I post this podcast, I actually think to myself, if I were to die this week, people will still be able to find this podcast and whoever needs this message will still be able to find it. And that gives me such a tremendous feeling of peace. I can't even describe to you. It makes me feel like, okay, good. So it's not all for nothing. And I didn't just go through all this total hell and for no reason whatsoever. So this podcast is my elixir for humanity and for whoever finds this um, podcast. So the treasure can be um, something that heals other people. That's what an elixir is. It's basically something that heals. And I hope that you find healing in some of the things that I talk about. And at the very end of this section, uh, Vogler says, the special world exists and it can be survived. So this is the exact, this is the sentence. Sometimes the elixir is treasure one on the quest, but it may be love, freedom, wisdom, or, and this is, I think, my elixir, the knowledge that the special world exists and can be survived. So that's a very, very, very basic overview of the hero's journey. There's a lot more to it. The Hero with a Thousand Faces is a huge book by Joseph Campbell. The Hero's Journey, uh, The Writer's Journey, I should say, by Chris Vogler. It's a great book. I really recommend you get it. He uses examples of films like Star Wars and uh, Wizard of Oz and other popular films um, to discuss different um, stages and, and of that film. And so it's very helpful because if you're a visual person, you're like, oh, I get it. Yeah, okay. Um but I just find it so incredibly helpful and to see like, yeah, so this isn't just some random thing. There's actually some type of, and it's not linear either. I don't think it's linear. I don't think we go, oh, I'm going to go on this journey. No, I don't want to go on the journey. Yeah, I want to go on the journey. Oh, here's the mentor. Oh, I'm crossing the first threshold. I don't think it's like that. I think it's more like it's very complex, but it's in general, it's this type of structure. And, you know, Sometimes there's parts of me that are just starting to, you know, do a call to adventure. And then there's another part of me returning with an elixir because like starting the podcast was, um, wanting to return with the elixir was my call to adventure. It was like, I really want to do this. But then there was this whole journey of like how to do this podcast and who to listen to and who not to listen to and how to get support and, you know, all the different things I went through to launch this podcast was its own little, you know, podcast journey, (laughs) hero's podcast journey. And then 
But at the very same time, it's also the elixir, hopefully for somebody. So I hope you understand that it's complex. It's not the way that I'm explaining it. Probably it's not linear, but this is just a thing, a, a structure to just think about and learn from and think about how this affects your life and how it can better your life if you can understand it a little bit more. And I'll probably go into like sections and break them down a little bit more in various different shows because that seems to work out better. Like if I'm basing it on a theme and then I'm like, okay, this is resurrection. And then we'll talk the whole show about resurrection. But this show, I really just wanted to give you the overview because I've been telling you I'm going to give you an overview and I hadn't. And I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm going to give you the overview. So that way we have it. Show number eight is the overview of the hero's journey. So all of the links to Joseph Campbell's work, Chris Vogler's work, Dara Marks, her work, um, all everything you need to know about this stuff will be in the show notes on IHaveDreamsDammit.com. And on the homepage, there's all the way on the right top menu, there's a button for episodes. If you press that and go all the way down to episode number eight, that's this episode. And that's where you'll find the show notes for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you got something out of this. And I do hope you consider buying The Writer's Journey by Chris Vogler. It's very good. And if you're really into all this and it really struck something with you, then I recommend you get Joseph Campbell's A Hero of a Thousand Faces because that's even way crazier and more in depth. If you have any questions for me, please feel free. You can send me a message on the website, IHaveDreamsDammit.com, or you can send me an email at IHaveDreamsDammit at gmail.com. Today's show was brought to you by the Ag and Art Film Festival. If you have a film that features agriculture or art or both, is a documentary or a narrative, a short or a feature, you can enter your film exclusively on filmfreeway.com and enter Ag and Art Film Festival.